¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Paula Bianchi, responsable de comunicaciones en el Instituto Saras. Siendo las 13.58, estamos iniciando la transmisión del seminario web que vamos a comenzar en unos minutos presentándolo como es debido. O sea que vamos a darle dos minutos para que todos los asistentes entren y a las 14 horas en punto vamos a iniciar la transmisión. Muchas gracias por estarse uniendo a este seminario web organizado por el Instituto Saras, en el cual, bueno, tenemos a Martin Schaeffer, director del Consejo Asesor del Instituto, como expositor. El, la presentación del día de hoy, bueno, como ustedes lo han visto, voy a hablar de algo que nunca había pensado, me pregunto qué será. Entonces, les damos unos minutos más para que entren y ya comenzamos con el seminario web del día de hoy. Y ahora soy yo hablando o esperamos un eh, momentito. Eh, lo que vamos a hacer, Marte, muchas gracias, es están entrando los asistentes al seminario, las personas que se han inscrito, y vamos a dar un par de minutos, falta un minuto para las 14 horas. Eh, mientras Perfecto. tanto, estamos eh, corroborando temas de, de sonido, vamos a pedirle a los asistentes que nos confirmen si nos escuchan y nos ven correctamente. Ya veo que hay personas que están escribiendo eh, a través del chat. Tenemos a Camille Simonet. ¿Qué tal, Camille? ¿Cómo estás? Y a César Augusto eh, también. Muchas gracias. Les pedimos que si quieren también eh, contarnos desde qué lugar se están conectando. Andrea Casa, es un gusto eh, también que nos acompañes en el seminario web del día de hoy. Eh, vamos a empezar, entonces, en un minuto ya la transmisión oficial de este, esta actividad. Siendo las 14 horas en punto, entonces comenzamos con el seminario web del día de hoy, contarles que este seminario web eh, se desarrolla en el marco del curso de posgrados en sistemas socioecológicos, organizado por el Instituto Saras, el cual está en este 2019 en su segunda edición, eh, y bueno, los invitamos a que visiten nuestra web porque vamos a tener una edición 2000, 2018, perdón, vamos a tener una edición 2019. Eh, en el seminario web nos acompaña, como mencionamos anteriormente, el doctor Martin Schaeffer. Martin Schaeffer es el, es el director del Consejo Asesor del Instituto Saras. Además, eh, Martin eh, lidera el grupo de ecología acuática y gestión de la calidad de, de agua de la Universidad de Wengeningen de Holanda y trabaja en el análisis de los mecanismos que determinan la estabilidad y la resiliencia de los sistemas complejos. En, actualmente Martin trabaja en la identificación de señales de alerta temprana para la identificación de transiciones críticas. Eh, además, eh, integra consejos editoriales en un conjunto de revistas científicas y libros, y participa en el Consejo Científico del Instituto Bayer y el Instituto para NIMS. Martin Schaeffer, además, es músico, toca el violín, la mandolina y la guitarra. Así que, Martin, eh, darte las gracias por estar con nosotros, contarles que eh, él en este momento está desarrollando un workshop que tiene lugar en el Instituto Santa Fe de Estados Unidos y producto del de el intenso trabajo va a desarrollar el seminario web en su lengua materna, o sea, en inglés, igualmente le hemos pedido a Martin que si puede hablar despacio para que intentemos eh, comprendernos todos, igualmente al final de su exposición eh, vamos a tener un espacio de preguntas e intercambio con los asistentes, tienen el panel desde el cual nos están mandando sus comentarios en este momento, y además también pueden encontrar en, en su panel de mando un icono donde se levanta la mano para poder también darles la participación. Así que bueno, los dejo entonces con Marten, eh, muchas gracias a todos por acompañarnos. Okay, thank you, Paula, and uh, and thank you all for uh, for attending. Um, it's wonderful to know that you're there, although I I can't see you. I wish we were all together in at at Sarah's. 
Um, I'm, I'm now in the Santa Fe Institute, and that's for Sarah's also an important place. It was a, one of the inspirations we had for setting up Sarah's. So, if you think about it, the core business of, of scientists is thinking. Ben Sar. So it's a bit strange that we rarely ever think about how we are thinking. How, how does it work? How do you get a new idea? Uh, <clears throat> we've been giving that quite a bit of thought when we were setting up SARAS. And we've talked a lot about it with, with other scientists, also with artists, because the brains of artists and scientists work quite the same, as I will explain later on a bit. So the, <clears throat> the title of my talk, I didn't come up with that myself. It was an artist that came up with it, a writer, a Dutch writer, Ton Tellegen. And he writes beautiful children books. I don't know if they're translated. I think they're very difficult to translate because they have a lot of subtlety in the language. The Ton Telgen is fascinated with the way our brain works and the way language works. Language, of course, is, is, is the main tool that we have to shape our, our thoughts, or perhaps one of the tools, perhaps there is other tools. Let's think about that. Uh, the next uh, this hour <clears throat> so today i'm going to i'm going to think about something i've never thought about before i'm so curious what that will be so that that's beautiful that's a beautiful way of stating it let me give another example of his playful way of thinking about thinking uh, one of the stories two friends the they're the two main persons of the of the books. It's the ant, La Hormiga, and um, and the squirrel, the acorn. Uh, that's the ardillo. And the squirrel is walking in the forest, and suddenly sees the ant on the floor, with the head down on the on on the forest floor. So he says. What's up? What's the problem? Why are you with your head down, laying down? And the aunt says, I don't know. My head is so heavy. I think I know too much. Oh, says the squirrel. Then maybe you have to forget something. Hmm, says the aunt. Forget something, but, but what should I forget? Uh, I don't know, says the squirrel. Why don't you forget me? You? No, I, uh, I will never forget you. Hmm. And they're trying to figure out the best way to help the ant. And suddenly, oops, the ant lifts the head. Oh, says the squirrel. What happened? I don't know, says the ant. I must have forgotten something. What did you forget? I don't know. I forgot. So that's the kind of like thinking about thinking that um, I, I find fascinating. So we're we're thinking all the time, and and at Cyrus we hope to develop useful thoughts. I'm here at the Santa Fe Institute, which is very famous for for developing original ideas, and they have given a lot of thought to how to engineer that, how to what should you do for that, get outside space, <clears throat> places where people can work alone, places where they can cooperate, what kind of people should you invite? <clears throat> At Cyrus, one of the, the things we, we decided is that, um, okay, we are inspired by the Santa Fe Institute, by other institutes, but we want to make something different, something that is not a, a copy of something else, but something that is an example leading the way. <clears throat> and, we're different, I think, from many places at Saras in, in the way we are we're trying to incorporate arts in the in the thinking. <laughs> so we've <clears throat> we've talked to, to artists about how they think and, and scientists and we had workshops. And one example of an artist that, that shared his thoughts on that 
was um, uh, Pancho, uh, Francisco Gazitua, a, a world famous sculptor. <clears throat> in his 70s, I think, 80s maybe. And when we asked him, so how did you get your ideas? <clears throat> he said, I don't know, I've just been walking around, picking up stones here and there. So that's what we call, I think, serendipity. You just run into an idea. And when you see it, you recognize it. And then you pick it up and you do something with it. So as a scientist that I have talked a lot about the question how, how thinking works in science is Ken Arrow. And Ken Arrow passed away last year, <clears throat> 93 years old, I think, and was very active till, till his last years. He got the Nobel Prize um, for economics, the youngest ever to receive a Nobel Prize for economics, but when I think he was already 90 or so, or late in his 80, 80s, he still published a paper as the first author in, in Nature. Uh, about uh, about how you have to think about the value of things in the future, which is very important for thinking about sustainability. You have to make the choice between doing something now or keeping something for the future in a way. So Ken, <clears throat> Ken was famous for starting many, many new ideas in, in economy. <clears throat> An, an economist once told me that Perhaps all the major branches of economy have some early papers that are produced by Ken Arrow. He started many lines of thinking. <clears throat> so one quote from him that I got when I was like talking to him in, uh, in Sweden is uh, asking how, how, how his mind works. He said, um, this is, a way of phrasing it he said this is so different from anything i do i must be interested so he was always interested in <clears throat> very broadly very curious about everything and another quote from him when he was giving advice to graduate students was uh, they asked him what is the best advice you can give and he said well <clears throat> In your career, whenever you can change the topic you study, do it. So <clears throat> I think that's another illustration of how, how explorative he has been. So do, the Sarah's workshops with artists and scientists, um, they have led us to, to write a few papers together that I'm sure um, Nestor can, can guide you to. <clears throat> and in one of those, <clears throat> We've tried to, to figure out what are the, actually the, the differences and the similarities between artists and scientists. And we came up with a, with a lot of ideas. And, and later in Holland, I, I thought there must be some science about this. And I ran into a psychologist, Matthijs Baas, that did his PhD on creativity. So it's the thing he does, the, the science he does is studying creativity. And he pointed us to a lot of good literature on this also. And one of the surprising things that you can find in the literature is that uh, artists and scientists are, are, are very similar <clears throat> in the way they, they work. So what, um, what they did is summarize a lot of studies psychological studies of the character traits of artists and scientists. And they found that they are very, very much the same. Um, they looked at, at, at successful scientists that really made a difference at high impact and so, and successful artists that really were widely appreciated, uh, could live very well from their art. <clears throat> and. I think the number one character trait that we shared was openness to new experiences, like being curious, being open, trying everything. So you can imagine that that is important. 
um, to get inspiration if you want. So what is that? What is inspiration? What is a new idea in science? Well, uh, you often hear that new ideas are usually combinations, new combinations of old ideas, right? We're all standing on the shoulders of giants, of the, of the, of the ones before us. Uh, <clears throat> but, but what makes a really cool new idea that uh, there, it's interesting that there was a recent study on that, studying millions of scientific articles and <clears throat> looking which ones were most cited and to which that related. And they showed that articles that are very influential, very highly cited, so that's then a proxy for, for being an important new idea, those articles very often combined a, a, a connection to an existing body of science. So they looked at that from the references in the article. They were referring to one field of science, but combining that with references to a, a different field of science that was rarely combined uh, from that other field. So they made a new combination. <clears throat> and, of, and of course, that that's rare that's rare and it gives often the big breakthroughs so why is it so rare maybe it's rare because we usually don't have that attitude of can arrow so this is so different from anything i do i must be interested no in, instead we we study one topic we we get very knowledgeable about it we focus on it and to be efficient with our time, we don't look into very different things because you can only do one, one thing at a time. Uh, well, it is, it is those very unexpected combinations that sometimes give you the new ideas. And this is like shown in this study. So, so one aspect of producing really new ideas is to make sure that you in, in your mind, you somehow internalize a very strange collection. Strange in the sense that it's not, it, it, it doesn't make any sense why those different things should be together. <clears throat> can be about making bread or um, how to construct an atomic bomb, what they did here, or um, what is the nature of um, competition in paleolithic periods and you name it there are so many interesting things in the world <clears throat> and the more diverse that that collection of little fragments is that you have in your mind the more likely that you can make some unexpected combinations there and one way to make this broad collection is to um, to talk to very different people. Another way is to just roam the internet and just look what you find. Um, so there are many different ways to do that. Pick up a, a, a book from the library, read uh, Nature magazine about all the kind of crazy things they, they publish. Another thing is <clears throat> to put that to put some of those things together into a novel combination. <clears throat> so for that, you usually need to be alone. You usually need some peace of mind. So that's, that's it's often on long walks or when you're taking a shower or when you're all by yourself in a, or maybe cooking, suddenly you get, you get this, this connection. So, <clears throat> It's important if you think of an institute or constructing an institute, it's great to be together with other people and discuss. But as you all know, this gives you so many ideas that you become very restless. Then you need time alone to process them and see what you can do. So that's another characteristic that is common between scientists and, and artists that was found in the psychological studies is that you also 
um, the, the, the character trait of being autonomous. You don't mind being alone. So it's a, it's a strange combination, perhaps. You like to talk to everyone, curious about everything, but then also you like to be alone. It's, it's the alternation between the two things that, uh, that is productive. And what for me was a bit an eye opener uh, when I looked at that literature is that there is another set of character traits that seem to have nothing to do with, with all this. And successful artists and successful scientists, they're usually rebellious, they're norm doubting, they don't care what is the norm, they don't care what anybody thinks. They can be a bit hostile. Well, there. What are you saying about my my work? I don't care what you think about it. I I want to do this. They don't give up. They're they're autonomous. And when you think about it, it makes sense. It's a very different set of character traits again. But science and arts, it all sounds very nice, and it is very, very nice. I just love love it. But it's not always a smooth road. So you get an idea, and then you you want others to believe your your new idea. You want to publish it into a journal. And very often that's hard. People say, well, you know, this is not new or this is crazy. Or, this has happened uh, many times in, in, in scientific history that really important ideas uh, were first uh, rejected by, by journals. Um, there are numerous examples of Nobel laureates that uh, almost got kicked out of science or, or failed before finally it was recognized that their idea was really a great idea. <clears throat> so, so you need you need to to get to to have these these character traits that helps you get novel ideas, but then you need to be persistent also to uh, to make it into uh, a final product that is that is acclaimed and then you need to be able to sell it well you need to be able to to talk well to to present it well so that that that's a combination of quite different things and and few people will combine all that now fortunately you don't have to do science alone you can team up and so you can team up with people that are are good at, at different things maybe somebody is good at the, doing the talking and selling the whole thing another is another person is good at is, is a bit introvert but good at doing whatever the mathematics or, or counting the little animals that you you needed um, and if you're in a team and your paper get rejected and people say it's nonsense then it's easier in a team to uh, to drink a good uh, nut and say well they're crazy we are not crazy we're we're gonna carry on with this so the teaming up is 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 very is uh, is very important in science you see most of the of the really powerful work nowadays comes from teams in arts it's much less the case you, you see it relatively rarely. Mostly it's quite a solo enterprise, but in science we have the, the luxury and, and also uh, the fun of uh, being able to, to do work in teams. So one of, the, one of the pitfalls when you make a team is that you, you pick people that you like uh, well, that's good, actually. But people that you like are often people that are like you. Uh, when you get more of the same, that's not the best recipe for for producing very good new work. The best recipe is to have a quite diverse group. So that's, that diversity, again, there is a lot of science on that. There was, there was a recent paper, I think, uh, even showing that um, that gender diversity is really important. The papers that have the, the highest impact in, in science are papers that combine men and women. And there is also work that shows that cultural diversity of author teams 
is also positive for the impact uh, they have. There is also work in, in art, work in, um, uh, for instance, in, in fashion design. There, there is often uh, teamwork involved. And they showed that um, multicultural teams for fashion design actually tend to be more successful. And there is a downside to it. it uh, if you have a very diverse team and you don't um, really go together very well, if you don't appreciate the difference, then it has the opposite effect. You just are irritated by the others. So it's this combination of seeking diversity and truly appreciating diversity that uh, that's very useful actually i think that's the way we we've uh, we've created the saras institute uh, nestor and i appreciate each other very very deeply and we're very different and uh, we're all a bit also a bit the same we're we're both a bit um, despitado about a bit chaotic so that's why it's very important for us that we also have people like Michaela now and, and, and Paula and it's it's about it's about seeking that that complementarity and um, when you think of uh, of making a team that that is really producing new things so of, of course in Sarah's we also we are also seeking the diversity, the diversity of branches of science, mathematicians, biologists, economists, uh, diversity of, of cultures, if we can. The more we can diversify, um, the better. Also seeking diversity, trying to be in touch with with politicians, policymakers, teachers. I think also diversity of of age is is really important. To go from children to very old people, anyone interested. I found it fantastic to 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 be able to interact for for years with Ken Arrow in his nineties. Um, 40 years older almost than I am. And in the same workshops we had young, just starting PhD students and having this mix of generations can be very powerful too. Actually, again, there is science on that. Science showing that a powerful new uh, outcomes papers are often combined by, by uh, a combination of very young and old, beginning and senior uh, authors. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, that that that's the challenge we have in Saras is to to try to assemble that diversity and to create the conditions where you have this alternation between inspiring discussions, talks and the possibility to go alone for a walk on the beach uh, or so. So um, I would really like to, to have some interaction with, uh, with you all. I don't know what your questions or interests are. Uh, let me see the time. We have half an hour. I can talk a bit more by myself, but, but maybe there is somebody that wants to make a remark or, or, or have a question. So what about opening up, uh, Paula, for, for discussion? Paula, Paula. Thank you, Marte. I'm here. Um, let me see. We can read some questions from the, the attenders. Eh, Valentina Fonseca, tú me estás preguntando si puedes mandar alguna pregunta ahora. Efectivamente, sí. Valentina eh, está presente desde Colombia y nos saluda y nos da las gracias. Mientras, um, Mar Martin, eh, si sí, yo leo a ti la pregunta en español, eh, despacio, tú podrás entenderla porque va a ser un poco difícil traducir en el momento para mí, al inglés.
Voy a leer la pregunta. Yo tengo una... Néstor. Yo te... eh, Marte, eh, muchas gracias por, por la presentación. Eh, tenía para ti una, una, una pregunta teniendo en cuenta tu experiencia en la Universidad de, de Wageningen y a su vez eh, la experiencia que estás recorriendo ahora en el Instituto Santa Fe y en Saras, ¿no? La pregunta es muy sencilla, es ¿cómo, cómo en la estructura de la universidad puede de alguna manera eh, promoverse la interacción entre el arte y la ciencia eh, para fomentar eh, una mayor capacidad de, de creatividad y por ende de transformación. La pregunta es, ¿es posible dentro de, de los esquemas clásicos universitarios? Bueno, muy, muy, muy buena pregunta. Um, well, first of all, Perhaps I, I should say that like this combination of, of arts and sciences, um, I think it's not, not, not everyone is interested in it. So I think it's not necessary to impose it. Um, but some are, are very interested in it and, and it's nice to facilitate it. Um, at our university, We are uh, experimenting now a bit. Uh, Milena Holmgren is experimenting with a course she is teaching on uh, sustainability science. And one of the things she has done is um, do the course together with an art school and mix the students of arts and science and have them discuss different perspectives on it. That worked out very well for some of the students and others didn't like it at all. And now what they're doing is allowing students to present the end result of their work in very different ways. So it can also be in art, art videos or so. But those are like low key, uh, simple things you, you can do. Uh, we have had quite a few artists interested in coming to the university and, and interacting with scientists, but it, it's never a, a large uh, dynamics involving many people. Uh, <clears throat> I know that in the University of Wisconsin, um, uh, they have for some years had a nice experiment where they had on the campus a walk-in place for art. So it was very low key, you, you could, uh, instead of going to the to the canteen you could go there and you could say uh, quickly make a drawing or or something else and there were artists there that would, would help you and do small training exercises in uh, for instance in, in creativity in writing creativity um that seemed to work work quite well we had uh, two of those uh, uh, people that did that initiative one time at saras and that sounded really nice to me at At, uh, at Saras, we have had uh, several occasions where we have um, <clears throat> had scientists and artists. I think one of the one of the, the pitfalls, one of the things that you should try to avoid, is to think that arts are just a way of of illustrating science. The more interesting thing is is to to think together about uh, things. I myself, I, I, I get on very well with some artists. Uh, lately, I've been working a lot with Tune Bjordam from Norway, and we love to talk about how we think about things, how, how our mind works. We love to work on, on common projects, and that has been very stimulating. So that's with respect to the arts. <clears throat> I think universities can also gain a lot by trying to to get more combinations of uh, even just scientists together because the, um, the chemists and the, and, and the natural scientists and, and, and uh, for instance, the psychologists, uh, they, they're rarely uh, talking together. And, and <clears throat> I've thought about ways of doing that. And sometimes you see people organize like a, a, 
an event to to get different branches of science together or so that never works very well people are not so interested in it i think the better way to do it is um, make sure you have a very nice food and a place to drink and, and hang out and <clears throat> where where people are just coming from this fresh fresh uh, bread from the from the wood oven and and hang out and and then um uh, try to kind of engineer uh, this kind of situations where people meet without explicitly having a, a a goal to talk about this or to talk about that. It's just what happens to you when you go to a party or a place. You you run into people. So, oh, what do you do? Oh, that's oh, that's very interesting. You get all kind of new connections. So the 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 Greek, the ancient Greek, uh, had a name for a pub uh, where you could eat and and drink. That was symposium. And they knew that was a place where where contacts happened, and that's why we have the name symposium now. So I think it's um, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't um, have a too big plan. You should just try to informally get people together, and that works best with good drinks and good food, I think, and nice places like Sarah's. Other reflections, ideas, questions. Is this what you were expecting or you want to follow up? Eh, vale, puedo seguir yo. Es, eh, ¿Me oigo? ¿Me, ¿Me oyen? Sí. Sí, te oigo. Néstor, tenemos preguntas de los asistentes. No sé si tú quieres proceder con alguna otra repregunta o si paso a darle micrófono a las personas que están consultando por el panel de preguntas. Eh, si quieres pasar y tenemos algunas preguntas más aquí en, el, en la sala, pero si quieres vamos a abrir al, al auditorio, al resto del auditorio. Perfecto. En este momento le voy a dar a activar el micrófono a Valentina Fonseca. Eh, que nos está siguiendo desde Colombia. Valentina, ¿qué tal? Te escuchamos. Hola, bien, gracias. Eh, yo soy ecóloga, también eh, hago algo de pintura y de danza. Y mi pregunta es eh, para Marte, mmm, eh, ¿cuál es, digamos, si existen algunos mecanismos de juntar arte y ciencia de manera no obvias? A eso me refiero, y para explicar voy a poner un ejemplo. Eh, si estoy haciendo una investigación sobre palma africana, ¿cómo hago para que eh, la conexión con la pintura no sea pintar una palma? Que sería como el resultado obvio, ¿verdad? ¿Qué, qué opciones, qué alternativas o, o qué, qué, qué otros ejemplos has visto, qué experiencias desde otras partes has visto donde haya una representación del arte de una investigación que no sea obvia? No sé si me hice entender. Ya, sí, yo, yo creo que bueno, es, es, es muy interesante la pregunta, muy difícil también. Yo creo que hay, hay muchas maneras. No sé si viste el special issue de Ecology Society, uh, the journal. Hay, hay ejemplos bien bonitos. Um, Digo yo, que yo, yo no es, esperaba. So there is one, uh, it's maybe not what you, what you mean, but there, there was one thing that surprised me, and that was um, someone that was trying to study the change in the mountains of Spain, where the the pastores the herders um were not herding anymore people the young people didn't like to go high in the mountains anymore uh walking behind the cows uh, all day so that's that's that uh, tradition disappeared and they were interviewing the old herders about it how they felt about it and they were melancholic about it because the landscape was changing, you got all kind of trees coming back, the landscape was closing, 
Um, but they also understood the youth that they didn't want that. And but what what struck me was the technique they used because they took the liter literally the the words of the herders, and the herders actually were artists in a way because they formulated their thoughts in very few words and in very poetic words. They were in a way poets. So then they used a technique of poetic analysis from the humanities to, to characterize the, the content and the emotion in the words of the herder. So I found that a beautiful way of combining humanities and actually seeing the, the herders as artists in a, in a way. Another example of what for me was an eye opener is when I worked with Tune Bjordam on, on the, the movie uh, Critical Transitions, uh, uh, we were, uh, the first idea was to have this movie as a kind of illustration of my work on critical transitions in, in society and, and in nature. But it didn't work out that way because the techniques she used, they just didn't work for like what we thought of as early warning signals and tipping points. Instead, what, what the technique showed and what the, what the images showed was that a transition to a very new situation uh, was gradual and was very complex. And in the hindsight, if you look back it, at the video, everything had changed. But when it was happening, you didn't realize that was changing. So that's, at first I was disappointed. And then I thought, well, that, that's beautiful because that's actually how it is. So how is it that people experience the start of the Second World War in my country, in Holland? In, they, did they see there was something that was really changing the world or was it a gradual day-to-day -day thing and they were still bringing the kids to school? And it, I think it was much more like that. So then you can ask the question, how do we know if we are in a transition as a society? Is the world really changing now? Is the climate really changing? And that inspired us to look in a different way at the mathematics of, uh, of change. And now we have a project with mathematicians where we are asking that question. If you are in a really complex system and you may have um, a tipping point, but it's a tipping point that, where you have only very local information and, and looks very chaotic, can you still recognize it? So for me, that's an example of like things being really open-ended. You, 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 you don't have a big plan. You don't have a recipe. You just go and play together. You, do, you, you, you have fun, try to follow your fascination. And, and then when there is something strange that you don't understand, well, that's the great thing. When you don't understand something, that, that, that's beautiful. And then you, what's this? And, and you talk about it. And so those thoughts we have developed uh, together. And, and for me, that kind of like playful interaction for which you need to take time and be patient. And, for me, that has been the most productive. Thank you, Martin. Nestor, vamos con la pregunta que tengan desde ahí, desde el auditorio. Ya, yeah. perfecto. Te, te, te paso aquí eh, la intervención. Le dejo la palabra a Walter. Walter. Buenas tardes, Martin. Buenas tardes. Eh, Muchas gracias por tu presentación, pensar sobre el pensamiento que nos hace pensar a todos. Y, y, y realmente la idea de vincular eh, arte y ciencia no es algo común, ¿no? son dos comunidades que aparentemente están como distantes, a pesar de que tienen mucho en común, como tú decías, tanto en arte como en ciencia, el método es muy importante. Eh, y ahí mi pregunta o, o, o solicitud de una reflexión de tu parte apunta que eh, los científicos generalmente saben comunicarse muy bien entre sí eh, y usan un lenguaje particular a través de papers y, 
y, y codifican el, la comunicación en términos que muchas veces no son accesibles para otros técnicos, para tomadores de decisiones, para eh, actores del sector privado, público en general. Y entonces te pregunto si te parece que puede haber una contribución muy importante de los artistas en ayudar a decodificar los mensajes de la ciencia, incorporando a veces elementos emocionales y, y facilitando la apropiación por parte de la sociedad. Bueno, sí, sí, sí muy interesante. Ahí, creo que ahí hay varios aspectos. Uno es, eh, como dices tú, la emoción. Es... Eh, As scientists, we are all often a bit uh, disappointed in society because uh, we figured out how everything works and what would be the best thing to do. And then uh, nobody seems to pay attention. So that, that happens all the time. And, and one, of the, one of the aspects there, of course, is that uh, really the... Uh, the decisions we make, the choices we make in life, are largely not made on a rational basis. They're made on an intuitive and emotional basis. Um, and, and, we, and we systematically overestimate how rational we are when we make decisions and how, how rational other people are. So, so arts speak much more to the the part of humans that, that really make the decisions, that, that create the opinions. <clears throat> um, we have in Holland uh, the Academy of Sciences, and we have since a few years also the Academy of, of Arts, and those are the, the most important artists of Holland. And if you, if you ask people in the street, If they know the names of people in the Academy of Sciences, you, you mention them a few names and who they are, they know nothing. But they all know the artist. They all know the famous singer, the composer, the, the painter. Uh, it speaks just, uh, just much more to, uh, to, to the soul and, and the part of people that make decisions, of course. So in that sense, I think you're, you're completely right that a partnership is, um, is important. <clears throat> and and when you mention language, I think that's um, that's an interesting point. I uh, I am uh, I'm lucky to to have a son that started studying language, and I learned a lot from talking to him. He um, he pointed me to to important philosophers that show that language is a very powerful uh, way of expressing thoughts. That language is also a prison it limits you you have a certain language and that language shapes the way that you look at the world so the language we have as scientists as scientists um, shapes the way we think and we look at things and i like that about um, interacting with non-scientists they they don't have that that um that language So they force you to use another language and, and they ask things in another language to you. And, and the same is for artists that have often very surprising angles at something. And I mean, it doesn't have to be artists. Children are also great to, to, to help you uh, try to get your mind out of this trap of, uh, of the same way of, of looking at, uh, at things. Uh, I think we all know that, that that questions from children and and being forced to explain something to your mother or so is very good for for clearing your mind about uh, things and, and sometimes getting very new ideas. So I think there is nothing special about artists. We are all artists and we're all scientists in a way too. Um, but it's it's a cool group to hang out with and, and they have good artists have Uh, they, they're really interested uh, in in the world. In uh, artists have this interest in finding something essential in the world and pointing our our view to it. 
that's the same that we have as scientists. Only as scientists, we have this limitation that then all, also we want to give an answer, to give a solution. And often the, the answers are more interesting than the solutions. And you should, uh, or the, I mean, the, the questions are more, more interesting than, than the answers. And, and questions stay interesting much longer. If you read the famous questions of, uh, of Plato, for instance, and, and Aristoteles, and you look at their answers, the answers are a bit outdated often, but the questions are still really interesting. So I think that's um, that, that that's part of the of of the power of the partnership that we can have with uh, with artists. Muchas gracias, Martin. A ver si me escuchan. Sí. Vamos a ir con una pregunta de Miguel Valenzo, quien está en este momento desde Buenos Aires. Um, le voy a habilitar el micrófono a Miguel, a ver si puede formular. En caso contrario, Miguel, si tienes algún inconveniente, formulo yo tu pregunta. Te ya. podríamos escuchar en este momento. Creo que no tiene... Ah, no, tiene un problema con el micrófono, así que voy a formular yo. Um, Miguel pregunta eh, sobre si tú puedes hablar sobre el manejo del miedo, dice que esto es una de las principales cuestiones que limitan el proceso creativo. ¿Podrías hablar un poco más cerca del micrófono? Porque... Sí, cómo no, Martín. Eh, Miguel Vanenzo pregunta eh, si tú puedes hablar acerca del manejo del miedo. Eh, este es la, una de las principales forzantes que limitan el proceso creativo. El miedo de, de científicos, de, el miedo de hacer algo mal. The fear uh, in general, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sí. <coughs> bueno. <coughs> sí, sí, yo creo que que, que entienda que de qué se trata la, la cuestión y eh, es otro punto muy interesante eh, lo que estamos haciendo en la, en, en la ciencia en la universidad yo creo es, es eh, a veces crear un poco de miedo eh, we, we teach the students mainly how not to make a mistake right how you have to do uh, to set up an experiment, how you have to do statistics. And it's all about not, not making mistakes. And it, it's a great limitation of science in a sense compared to art, because in art you can do anything you want. In science there is one big limitation and then whatever you do is okay, but it has to be correct. And that's very scary. And, and it's also, it, it can also um, limit your, your, your freedom of exploring. So I think this is a, this is a good, uh, this is a good moment for another quote from the Nobel laureate Ken Arrow. And this quote is, uh, goes uh, this way. If you're not wrong, two thirds, of the time, you're not doing very well as a scientist. But if you're wrong, you better find out yourself, not only because it's more pleasant, but also because you learn from it. So I think that that illustrates how he realized that it's important to take risk. It's important to dare to make mistakes. Um, I've talked about this with Lori Beth Clark. She is one of the of the Sarah's uh, advisory board and the co-director of the board now. <clears throat> she is an, an art uh, teacher and an artist. And she told us that um, they actually teach this, this risk taking in arts to the students. They teach them um, to, to go as far as you dare in, in crazy directions but still feel in control. She, she described it like they're sailing a boat, a sailing boat, in a heavy wind, 
and dare to let it go like very crazy and then but feel that you have the power to bring it back into something that you can use so it's this risk taking that indeed i think um in science we could pay more attention uh, to it and perhaps in university we can just make it more explicit that yes, you know it's it's okay to be wrong it's important to be wild enough and curious enough in your exploration to formulate things that are wrong because that's the search process for new ideas but then of course comes the next phase which is the scientific method as we as we teach it we teach the scientific method which is basically about uh, making sure you're not wrong but that doesn't mean you you can't be wrong in the first place it's good to start with crazy things and then try to use all the skills you've, you've been taught to work it out. So if we teach only the scientific method in terms of how not to make mistakes, how to do good statistics, do good experiments, uh, in a way it's like teaching uh, chefs that, that want to be good chefs in a restaurant, um, teaching them how to make beautiful dishes by just showing them the dishes without telling them how we did it because how we did it in a way is by taking risks it we never talk about this part of science that is the risky part ex the explorative part go for the crazy ideas um, that part you never see it back in publications and and also we don't we don't uh, we don't usually teach it so I'm, I think you you're quite right that's important to think about about El Miedo uh, to do something wrong uh, and to, um, to to talk about it and, and and to see how we can be more explorative. So it is it's good to take risks and you don't have to be afraid as long as after that you you, you apply the, the strong scientific method and you become very critical but you shouldn't be critical from the very start on because then you never get a, a crazy idea. Muchas gracias, Marten. Vamos a, a ir con una última pregunta, eh, ya que son casi las, las 15 horas, las 3 de la tarde, hora de finalización prevista del seminario web. Eh, y voy a leer una pregunta de Esteban Ortiz, quien escribe desde Maldonado, de acá de Uruguay, que dice, ¿cómo crees tú que la influencia de la práctica de artes diferentes a las que estamos acostumbrados, como puede ser un arte marcial, puede influir en la forma en que se piensa y se hace ciencia, como formas alternativas de arte. Can you can you read it close to the microphone and very slowly? Eh, leo de vuelta más lentamente. Lentamente. Eh, quisiera plantearle a Martin cómo cree que puede la influencia de las prácticas de artes diferentes a las que estamos acostumbrados, como ser un arte marcial, puede influir en la forma en que se hace ciencia. Uh, ah, yeah. ya. Yeah. No, <coughs> I think any, uh, any form of art, um, I think it's just very nice to use your brain in a different way. I don't know what is, I don't know much about the, the art de martial. I don't know what is, what is, if it is a creative thing when, where you um, create new things all the time or, or more an art craft where you, where you know a technique in a very good way. So I, I can't speak too well about the, uh, about that. Um, I I can imagine that the martial arts have an element of of putting your mind in a certain mode of concentration. Uh, so uh, I know that there is a lot of literature, uh, for instance, on uh, the effect of uh, meditation on 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 creativity, but also on the, the, the capacity to solve problems. Um, so, so definitely playing with the possibility of putting your mind in different modes 
I think is is always is fun and and is is usually usually beneficial. You just get out of a certain mindset, uh, do other things. There <clears throat> there is uh, this beautiful study showing that scientists that uh, do art as a serious uh, hobby, do art on the side, are more uh, produce more powerful science. So this is a correlational study where they show that uh, Nobel laureates are more often involved in doing art than people that are uh, members of the National Academy of Sciences. And those are more likely to do art as a, as a side thing than average scientists. And they didn't specify which art that was, whether that was martial art or poetry or, or music. But I think uh, uh, the, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's fun to do different things, to do science, different arts. Uh, it doesn't always have to be for a purpose. I make a lot of music. And sometimes people ask me, uh, so is this, uh, do you do this on purpose for producing better science? No, I just do it because I can't stop doing it. I just love it. So I think the same for martial arts and for for painting and, and dancing. I think it's very good for for humans, for your moods, for your for your relaxation. And and perhaps it's it's useful, it's useful for um, for allowing your brain to to work better in the end too. So I, I would say, you know, do try to do many different things, things you like. Um, it doesn't often have to to be useful or, or have a purpose. Like the same with working with artists, just do it for fun. And, uh, you know, hopefully something comes out of it. Let's not take it to, to let's not take it too seriously. We're in a, in a fantastic, uh, fantastic kind of profession. Yeah, it, it's a privilege to be able to to think about things, to, to interact with different people, and uh, I would say uh, let let's enjoy. And I think that if if we enjoy, our mind works better too. So thanks to you all for for asking such really really very nice questions. Uh, I, I hope for the ones that are at Saras that uh, they enjoy their stay a lot. And for the ones that are not at Saras, I hope you'll come to Saras uh, one day and that we meet there. Thank you all. Bye bye. Gracias, Martin. Un abrazo. Muchas gracias, Martin, por tu exposición. Y a los asistentes, decirle que este seminario web va a quedar grabado y en unos días va a estar subido seguramente en nuestra página web, así que los invitamos a que eh, sigan nuestra página www.saras-medioinstitute.org, eh, nuestras redes en Facebook eh, e Instagram, y que eh, se suscriban al boletín para que puedan estar al tanto de todas las actividades, cursos y demás del Instituto Saras. Que tengan todos muy buenas tardes, hasta luego. Chau, chau.